Welcome back to another Ask GMBN Tech. This is the weekly show where I get to try and answer your tech-related mountain bike questions. Don't forget, you can get your questions in to the email address that's on the screen right there, or you can leave them in the comments below. Make sure you fire those questions in. I love reading them and trying to answer them for you. So first up is from Jeff C. He wants to know, how important is frame protection? Mainly on the down tube, I know rocks can chip away the paintwork, but will this compromise the frame if left exposed? Um, well, it kind of depends on the severity of that chip. Now, if it's on an aluminium frame, you're not gonna get any corrosion or anything. If it's on a steel frame, you could actually expose the steel there, so you could be susceptible to corrosion from road salt or anything else. But more importantly, what's gonna happen is actually that paintwork's gonna to continue to just flake off. So you really wanna address that as soon as possible. And whilst you do that, you wanna make sure you inspect it and make sure there's no sort of chance of it being an actual crack under there, especially if it's a carbon frame. Now, you can do this in a fairly simple way just with some clear lacquer or some top-up paint, but I do recommend having some sort of protection on that down tube there. Whether you get a dedicated protector or you do something yourself, whether that's with some inner tubes or something like a 3M rubber mastic tape, which is something you see like a lot of electricians use. So it's got quite a dampening feel to it, so it's good to just run a little sort of amount just on the downside of your down tube there. Now I have seen some frames suffer from cracks where they've had severe hits from rocks. And in fact, a really old frame I used to have back in a sort of, I don't know, probably 2007, an old intense Socom. Really loved that frame and I did actually eventually crack it somewhere else, but it had a huge dent on the down tube, which was from a flying rock somewhere in France, I think at the time. But I reckon if it had one more hit in that same place, it would have cracked there. So it just goes to show you that any sort of chip or dent can lead to more damage. So cosmetically, no, but it's worth keeping an eye on it, but it's definitely worth having some protection there just in case. Okay, next up is from Thethard06. There are tons of bike manufacturers. Um, I'm looking to you guys as the experts. I live in Austin, Texas with some mild elevation. Is the Canyon Spectral AL 6.0 the best all-round bike for under two and a half thousand dollars? Thanks in advance. Um, well, it's well documented how, like the value that Canyon bikes can offer with their direct sales model. But I had to have a look online just to see what else there is. And there's some great bikes like Giant offers some really good value bikes. Although you're not gonna get a fork quite as good as what's on that Canyon. You get a Suntour fork on the Giant Trance. There's a Trek as well, the Fuel EX. Again, a really good bike from another reputable company, but just edged out slightly on spec. And I actually think that the Canyon in this case really is the best out there. So not only has it just had a new frame, like sort of facelift, so it's slightly new design with improved suspension kinematics on there. 140 up back, 150 up front. The spec on the thing is insane for the money. It looks like it's like a hand-picked selection of stuff on there. I mean, just looking through the specs, so you've got SRAM Eagle GX 12-speed, DT Swiss M1900 spline wheels on there, Maxxis wide trail tires, they're 2.6s, of course, the RockShox Pike RC fork and the RT rear shock on there, and a reverb stealth dropper post. Phenomenal amount of kit on there, so I think you're in safe hands with Canyon on that one. And I'm sure there are other bikes out there that are very good value for money, but I do think the Canyon pips them in this case. Next up is from Klaus Miller. Um, hi Dolly, it might sound crazy, but I can't find an answer to this question anywhere. Is it possible to build my specialized S140 TA fork which has 140 mil of travel into a 160 mil travel fork. I want to keep this fork because it's really light. Um, I'm not too familiar with that particular fork. I'm aware it's one of specialized own brand forks and it had travel adjust system on it. So I had 140 and I think it had a dial on it similar to the RockShox two-step system where you'd slam it down to about 115 mil of travel for those steep climbs. And if that's the case, then I don't think you can change that with any sort of parts that currently exist because it would interfere with that step down travel adjust system. Now, you might be able to do some kind of customization, uh, which would involve going to your local or an online suspension tuner, and they probably could using parts from other forks out there. So I think that's a 32 mil stanchion chassis on that. So you might be getting parts from Fox or say RockShox that might fit internally. 
it would need a new air tube on there, a longer one, but you're definitely gonna lose out on that travel adjust, and it would mean there's gonna be some sort of modification to the top cam system. So I'm actually not sure. I think you're gonna to have to check that one out. I will continue to try and find out for you, but I've heard nothing from Specialized at this time. Next up is from Mohammed, who is 169 centimeters tall, and he's riding an 18.5 inch virtual and 17.5 actual Trek Remedy. Uh, that's just the way that they reference their sizing. So the frame is on the upper limit of my size range, which I offset with a 35 millimeter stem. I found initially I struggled to lift the bike to practice manuals due to that additional length of the bike, but I found with lifting the stem one spacer ring, about 15 millimeters up, it made a major difference when lifting and getting into the manual position. Any thoughts, tips, or comments on the matter? Uh, well, yeah, because the setup of your bike, whether the bike's smaller or larger, is crucial to the way it feels. So first up, let's just address the bar situation. So a lower front end is gonna be really good for climbing, so it's gonna put you in a powerful stance for out the saddle climbing, and it's also gonna weight that front tire. So that's both good for climbing to stop it from wandering around, but also in descending, although, to a degree, mind. Um, also in descending, because you get extra traction on that front tire. However, it does mean other things, like lifting the front wheel up can be harder, because you're further away from the fulcrum of the bike, which, in that case of what you're doing, the fulcrum is the rear wheel axle. So your chainstay length is something else that affects that. So a longer chainstay, generally, to get the front end up as easy as with a short chainstay, you're gonna need a slightly higher bar position. Now you can achieve this by putting the stem up and down within your spacer selection, or by choosing a higher rise bar. In my case, I've got a 38 mil rise bar with a 35 mil stem on my Nuke Proof Mega, that's a size XL, and that's got a huge 450 mil chainstay on it. So I'm sort of maximizing on the length of the bike that I'm not gonna lose any climbing sort of traction or stability or anything by having a high rise bar because the bike is so long and planted, but it does mean by having that high bar, it makes it really playful and really easy to pop the front end up. So you can try these things, of course, at home with your own bike. You can also try that the bar roll will actually affect things quite dramatically. Rolling the bar forwards puts you over the front of the bike in a more aggressive position. Of course, rolling it backwards has that opposite effect. So yeah, all of these little things have small effects on your bike and how it handles. Next up is from TJC. Uh, when putting together a new bike, what are some important places to apply grease and how much? Um, how long's a piece of string? This is a hard one because it does depend on how much of the bike you're putting together. Are you putting the forks in it, the headset in, all these sort of things? Um, if so, there's different greases for different parts of the bike. Granted, you can get away with a single grease as long as it's uh, friendly to certain parts of your bike. Like if it's a carbon friendly grease, you can obviously use it on things like if it's a carbon frame or a carbon handlebar. So just a few things to take into account. Uh, if it's a threaded part, for example, or something that pushes in like the headset cups into the frame, you wanna be using a, just a generic grease. You don't wanna have anything like an assembly compound that's got particles in it, because it will make it really, really hard to remove those things later. But then other things that require clamping forces to keep them in place, like a handlebar stem, the way it's clamped, um, the way it clamps a handlebar. If you have an assembly compound on this sort of junction on the inside of here, it means you'll use slightly less clamping force on that bar to keep it in the right place. So that's obviously a great thing if you've got something like a carbon fiber handlebar, because you don't want to squash that. And the same applies to seat posts on a frame. Um, I made this video on where to use greases on your bike, and it covers greases, thread locks, compounds, assembly compounds, all that sort of stuff. So the link is in the description below, and it should hopefully answer your question in a lot more detail. Next up is from William Dunn in Australia. Uh, what tire compound is best for dry conditions? I live in Australia and it doesn't get very muddy here. Um, you haven't detailed exactly sort of the way you ride and the conditions you ride in other than the fact it's dusty. So I'll be quite general with this. So it does depend on what you want from a tire. Now, because you're gonna be riding in dry conditions and you're gonna have less chance of having stuff like wet rock, wet roots and stuff, I'd recommend going for a faster compound. So that means a firmer tire compound. It does mean you're gonna get less traction overall, but you're gonna have increased, you're gonna, the rolling resistance is gonna be a lot faster on that bike. And because you're riding in sort of dry, dusty conditions, it does mean you can adapt to that and get used to the way the tire feels. Now, Maxis, for example, do various different compounds. They do their Max Speed, which is a compound that might be good for you. But they also do compounds all the way down to like 3C and their Super Tacky compounds, which is incredibly soft. So if you run that sort of tire in your firm conditions that you ride in, you're gonna find a lot more drag, but a hell of a lot more grip. 
Now something a lot of racers do, whether it's cross country, enduro or downhill, is run a tire up front with slightly softer compound. Let's just say, like we were just talking about, the softest possible. So you've got maximum grip and traction for braking, cornering, all that sort of stuff. And then out back, run something a lot faster and firmer. So you kind of get the best of both worlds there. You've got where your body weight is, you've got it on a faster rolling tire with a firmer compound, so you're gonna go faster. And up front, you've got the traction. So that's a good combination to use. But also take into account the tire tread. So if I look at something quite generic, like a high roller, that is quite an aggressive tire, despite how fast it rolls. But you might not need a tire with that much traction on. So have a look at something, I'm just using Max's here as an all round example. Have a look at something like the one on screen, that's called the Ardent. So that is a really fast rolling tire, considering the size of the nobles on it. Certainly much faster rolling than the high roller. So you might wanna have a look at a tire like that just to give yourself a few more ideas of how to sort of reduce your rolling resistance but keep that grip and traction. And then one other factor, of course, is the size of the tire. A smaller tire is certainly gonna feel faster to ride, but you're not gonna have the cushion or quite as much traction. So it's kind of, you have to sort of weigh these things up and sort of address what you think is the best solution for you. Uh, next up is from AN underscore D, uh, or Andy, perhaps. Hey Doddy, I'm looking for a new set of wheels for my 29 inch wheel enduro bike, boost front and rear. Uh, what could you recommend me in terms of price, value, weight? Uh, my budget is around three to 400 euros. Um, oh, some minefieldable wheels to be honest. I mean, you said enduro, so I'm gonna base this completely on the fact that I'm currently running a set of Mavic XA Elite wheels on my Nukeproof Mega 290. Uh, they're probably not the sort of wheels I would pick outright because they've got 25 mil rim and I quite like a slightly wider rim, but actually they've been really good. They've got bladed spokes, they're really stiff fore and aft under acceleration and braking, comfortable wheels, they set up tubeless excellently. And you can get those for about 400 euros, but if you look online, I think you can get some real good bargains on them, um, quite a lot lower as well. Um, also, I had a look around, so the DT Swiss M1900, they represent really good value as well, and DT are obviously make some of the best spokes and nipples out there, so definitely worth considering. And finally, it's worth looking at Stans Flow and Crest. Stans also make really great wheels. But one other thing you might not have considered, because you said three to 400 euros as a budget, that's still a good amount of money. So one idea is to buy some rims, spokes, nipples, and hubs, and get those wheels built up for you. It doesn't cost as much as you might think, and you're always gonna get a really, really strong, really durable wheel, and sometimes stronger and more durable than the pre-built wheels that you can buy. So I'd definitely look into that option as well. And don't forget, you can buy all of those rims. You can buy DC rims, you can buy Mavic rims, you can buy Stan's rims. There's a lot out there on the market. And finally, the last one is from YS. Quite an unusual one. Are there any suspension manufacturers working on magnetic suspension for mountain bikes? Um, in all honesty, I have no idea. Um, I did look this up because I've not really heard of it before other than Canyon did this wild looking concept bike and they sort of came up with those images sort of towards the end of last year, about September, October, I believe. Um, there's a link on the screen now. If you have a look at this thing, it looks insane. So not only has it got magnetic suspension, bear in mind it is a concept bike, so it doesn't actually exist yet. So it's got a magnetic suspension, but it's also got a stealth electronic power assist drive system on it. So that could well be something we're gonna see in the future. And hopefully a concept bike that we might get to see at Eurobike or some of the exciting bike shows coming up this year. There have been a lot of interesting suspension designs over the years and Cannondale have done a lot of electronic based stuff in the past with lockouts, but nothing magnetic to date. So there we go, there's another Ask GMBN Tech Clinic done in the bag. Please don't forget that you can get your questions in on the email address on the screen or just add them in the comments below after this video and I'll start looking for those straight away for next week's show. If you want to see a couple more great videos, if you need to identify any annoying creaks and groans from your bike, click right down there. It's a kind of a Creaks 101. It'll help you identify all of those little places on the bike, save you hopefully the hassle of having to strip a bike in order to find one of those creaks. And if you wanna find out a bit more about us, click up here for the presenter's video. So Neil is the first one. Find out a bit about him, what his background is. There's gonna be more in the series. It's gonna be one from Blake, one from Martin, and one from myself. And I think that might be coming up next. So click up there and have a look at that. As always, click on that globe to subscribe. We've got new videos for you every single week. And of course, if you found this Ask Clinic helpful, give us a thumbs up.